Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's really nice to see so many friendly faces. I feel uh, feel supported and terrified. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Daniel West. I'm a student of Lama Yeshe Jimpas, and uh, I've been coming to Lion's Roar for about six years now. Uh, for most of that time, though, I was going mainly just to the, uh, the beginning meditation class that's on Wednesday evenings. And then sort of like gradually over time, I became more interested in the teacher and the teachings and the community. And so then last year in March, I participated in this, in this ceremony um, that's called Entering the Path. Um, and that's where I sort of expressed my interest in learning more about the Buddhist path and sort of taking the first steps. And then nine months later in December, I committed to, to walking that path uh, by formally taking refuge. Um, during the entering the path ceremony, I received this little, little pamphlet here, and there's not much in it, but it does have the four essentials of the path written in there. I thought I would just read those briefly. Uh, the first essential point is community, becoming involved in our community and the community around us. Discipline, making commitments to practices of meditation, health, and well-being. Transparency. Showing our authentic selves, opening up to vulnerability, to support each other and relate to one another. And finally, service, helping others in many ways. Uh, this talk today is really about all four of those points, but it's mainly focused on the third point, that of uh, vulnerability and transparency within the context of this Sangha uh, community. Uh, the title of the talk is actually, it's called uh, Talking Openly, Vulnerability and Transparency on the Path. And the first part of that, the Talking Openly, is a little play on uh, the talk show podcast that I do with my good friend Jack up in Washington. It's a weekly show that we do where we talk about the intersection of Buddha Dharma and just everyday life. Um, this, the, the, um, the subject matter is, uh, however, that of vulnerability and transparency was actually inspired by a Facebook post by Clemone Charles. And for those who don't know, Clemone is a friend of the Sangha, and he's one of the co-founders, along with Lama Jimpa, of the monthly expressions event that happens here. It's uh, music and art and poetry and that type of thing. And uh, in the Facebook post, Clemone had encouraged us to resolve to become bridge people. And the definition of a bridge person um, is noteworthy. It says, uh, someone who creatively bears their most vulnerable thoughts and experiences in order to offer peace and comfort to others in challenging times, even though they may be terrified of being called out or judged. So there was something kind of, uh, something about that post that really like resonated with me. And I think it's because I have a lot of those like experiences and thoughts that make me feel vulnerable. And there was something about, you know, like I'm a bodhisattva in training and the idea of somehow using that uh, to benefit other people seemed like really attractive to me. And in fact, it was actually the, uh, it was the suffering of those sort of perceived character defects that brought me here to Lion's Roar in the first place. So for most of my life, I've been riddled with like anxiety, doubt, fear, anger, you know, uh, loneliness, and just sort of like a general feeling of being like terribly imperfect. And so I'd done like a really good job to ignore these sort of like personal demons and uh, the tools I used were suppression, avoidance, and sort of numbing. And I primarily used alcohol, copious amounts of weed, and uh, social isolation. So those are my tools. Um, and so then at some point while I was living down near uh, Santa Barbara, um, I sort of hit figurative rock bottom and I started attending a 12 step program. And that's where I discovered the benefits of meditation, or at least some of them. And, um, and with the help of that group, I was able to quit, you know, the, the weed and the, and the alcohol for a whole year. And then I was like, I, I moved up here to Sacramento and I was like, I'm good. I, I, I did this all by myself. I don't need a group to do this anymore. I can be sober. 
And, and so, uh, so anyway, I, I really still wanted to meditate though, because I really enjoyed meditating and I thought there was something valuable about it. So I just like, I really just didn't want to like continue meditating with all this sort of like broken, messy addicts, you know, that are in recovery. Uh, I wasn't down with that. So I thought like I'd go find a community of like well balanced, happy, healthy people, you know, um, to <laughs> meditate with. And so, um, yeah, so I went looking and I found, uh, I found the beginning meditation group on Wednesday evenings. And I definitely thought that uh, I found what I was looking for. And so I started attending that every, every week. And so like those, those weekly meditations, they definitely helped me to calm down. You know, there was no doubt about it. I could see it. That's what I liked about it, that during the meditations I'd, and sort of the period after that, I would feel really calm. But they also shined a light on those, those demons I was trying to avoid. And that, I really didn't like that. Like I still felt restless and irritable and discontent, so to speak. And so the way it worked is I would like, I'd go to meditation like once a week and then the rest of the week I would numb out, right? And uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting at the time because the way it felt sort of was like uh, that I was like coming in and I would like basically like take a shower, right? Or take a bath and like get all clean. You know, and then I just get out and I'd put on the same old dirty clothes, stinky clothes, right? You know, uh, or, or I like I kind of actually think it's a little bit more like like um, like waking up in a dark room, right? And flipping on the light switch, and then, like you see all the filth, you know, and you see the clutter and you see the cockroaches scurrying around, right? And then just like flipping the light switch back off and like getting back into bed and forcing myself back to sleep. At least that's what the experience sort of felt like because confronting my demons seemed um, a lot scarier than sort of avoiding them or ignoring them. So then uh, when COVID hit, our meditation group had to go online and I was really fortunate <laughs> to be invited to join Sue Forrester at her home to do um, meditations. And I'm super confident that if it weren't for Sue, I would have stopped meditating right then and there. Sorry, I'm tearing up a little bit. <laughs> Um, so, of course, instead of like just meditating, now I also had Sue to talk to, and I was really struck by her, her authenticity and her sort of um, openness, her vulnerability, so she was able to tell me about problems in her own life and like how she was feeling about it, you know, and, um, and she also, she was curious about me, you know, so she would like ask me questions and I felt really safe talking to her and so i would be like oh yeah this is what's happening in my life and oh by the way yeah i'm using drugs and alcohol to kind of numb out and she was ah she was so attentive so understanding very compassionate very caring i didn't think this was going to happen <laughs> um she was never judgmental or critical or anything like that and so like i would i would dread going to her house sometimes right because i just knew she i just knew she was going to ask me like, are you still, are you still using, still using drugs and alcohol, you know, but like not in a judgy way. She never did that. Right. But I just knew she was going to ask me and I really didn't want to talk about it because I felt like ashamed, you know, and, um, but Sue, you know, um, she wasn't judgy. Like I said, she'd always sort of like gently shine her light of compassion on the situation, you know, and then she was always like relentlessly encouraging, you know, like you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was super nice. And in fact, I'll take a little break here uh, to um, share with you a little bit of Sue's medicine. I will give you a little taste of it. It's in the form of a poem that she wrote for Lama Jimpa's birthday a, couple, a few years ago. It goes like this. Arise, awake to the blossoming of a new day with calm in your mind, joy in your heart, and compassion glowing within. Breathe in deeply the life-giving air. Breathe out your sorrow and confusion. New opportunity is before you. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it as others have. Look to your shining guru. Support is there. Lean on your strong sangha, support is there. Listen to master teachers, support is there. All you need is already yours. Sit, sit, sit with the clarity and wisdom that is within you. You are the lotus rising from the mud of your fears. You are the lotus struggling through the murky waters of doubt. You are the lotus blossoming in the sun. With joyful effort, the growth is yours. And that's by Sue Forster over here, also known as Yeshe Palmo. So yeah, you know, 
once a week, I was not only meditating with a group of awesome practitioners, but I was also getting a dose of that kind of medicine right there. And so, you know, the thing is that because of previous religious trauma, like I was still super skeptical, right? Like I still like had <laughs> a, a lot of doubts and I was super reluctant to like participate in the group in any way, right? Um, but I had a lot of questions. And so I would plague Sue with questions. And then finally she was like, hey, you need to go talk to Lama. He's got some answers probably, you know, you can do a better job of this than me. And so like, I had no experience with Lama, like none whatsoever, but I made an appointment. And so um, like I showed up and I had made this extensive long laundry list of like all of my experiences, all my problems, all my questions, all my everything, it was long, right? And I brought it in and like, barfed it up in front of him, you know, and he was, he gave me all the time, all the space that I needed, you know, and he was so attentive, just like Sue, very attentive, very present with what was going on, non judgmental, very kind of compassionate, um, you know, and he didn't, there was no judging us, you know, he didn't like say that I was wrong or bad, or he didn't try to like fix me or anything like that. And I, I remember I just felt like seen heard and validated by him. And so then at the end of our meeting, he sort of gently offered me this little gem of wisdom to contemplate. And I kind of pissed me off. I was disappointed um, <laughs> because like, well, cause he chose to teach, right? Instead of like laying hands on me or like, I really thought maybe he would perform like a magical cure, you know, like a, like a, <laughs> like some kind of a spell or something. And like, whoa, like something would be transformed. I, but it wasn't like that, right? Like it was just a teaching, um, a powerful one that's resonated with me ever since. But, you know, what happened there was that I was like super impressed, like terribly impressed by it. And I knew like, I was like, man, whatever's going on here is not at all what I think it is. Like whatever I think is just completely wrong. So, you know, like I thought, I'd, well, I'll just keep investigating. And so I started attending some of the other practices here. So most notably, I would come to Vajrasattva Moon practice with Dirk, uh, and then I did Tonglin with Marie. Uh, and then I would sometimes come to like Sunday services too, you know, and everybody was so kind and so helpful, but I like, I still had so much confusion. I liked so much. Um, and I remained skeptical, super suspicious, and I was really weary, continued to be weary of the group dynamics. And I was like, you know, I'll just stay on the periphery. I'll just you know, right on the outside, it's fine. But then Patty called me. <laughs> and for those who don't know, uh, Patty is the Dharma secretary for Lion's Roar. And I had never really interacted with her before, just a little bit. Um, so when the phone call came, it was quite a surprise. Um, but her mild manners and her unassuming demeanor, her sincerity and her warm heart, they were like a, like a siren call a gentle song that disguised an irresistible force. That's what I wrote down. <laughs> and I didn't know, like I, sh I, I had no idea that that phone call was like the first of like many phone calls, many text messages and many emails. And they were all carrying messages of loving kindness and opportunities to engage, to learn and to be of service. And so, you know, like she would send me these invitations, like text messages and stuff like, hey, we're having a special event, maybe, you know, think about coming or, you know, she'd say like, come to Sunday potluck and things like that. Um, and sometimes I would, I'd go, you know, but it was always like with a lot of social anxiety, like always. And so like, I was really worried I, about not being a Buddhist, not fitting in about viewing, being viewed as like awkward, uh, uninteresting, unlikable, all that. And I'd been isolated for so long that I, I kind of felt like I just didn't have the social skills, like they were gone, like it wasn't going to happen. And so I was really worried about getting rejected by this community that I was really getting to like a lot. You know, I didn't want that to happen. Um, so my guard was still up, but I kept coming back. And I'd sometimes occasionally attend the recovery meetings and I'd accept opportunities to be of service. And time and time again, what I actually discovered were um, like real people, people who had their own problems, people who had their own addictions, people who had, you know, their own doubts, their bad habits, whatever, <laughs> their own neuroses, their own attachment, right? I saw it again and again. Um, but even though nobody was perfect, the thing that sort of struck me was that everyone seemed to have a, a high level of, of awareness 
of their situation. And they weren't like trying to pretend to be perfect or anything. Like they're just like, here I am, right? And that authenticity was super refreshing. And it kind of like, it made me feel safe. And then it, it helped me to relate and connect with people in a way that I really had stopped believing was even possible. So. And then something really magical happened. Patty called me again, Patty. She, uh, she needed help setting up for that expressions event that I was telling you about, you know, the one that's for the community that has the art and the music and the dancing and all that. Um, and I was like, man, I do not know what that has to do with spiritual practice, right? Like, I don't, I don't get it. And it was not my scene. It didn't sound like my scene. I was like, nah, I really don't want to do it. But uh, it's really hard to say no to Patty. So, <laughs> so I went. And like setting up, setting up wasn't a big deal at all. It was super easy. Um, but then people started to arrive and my social anxiety just like spiked, right? I, like I didn't know most of these people. I wasn't dressed right, you know, like all, all of my sort of insecurities and doubts, like I, I projected them onto everybody else that was there. And I got like super critical and super judgy of the artists, right? I, I hated it. I hated that expression. So as soon as it was over, I, I, like I remember I timed it to get to the dispensary before they closed because I just like I was like I need a beer and a joint right like I, like whatever that was <laughs> I don't want it right like and I was like I swore I was like I'm never ever ever gonna go back to another one of those expressions right I just knew I was like no hell no so then you know like of course like the next month Patty calls me he's like hey you want to set up expressions with me you know and I I couldn't say no <laughs> so but like this time it was a little bit easier because like I, I kind of knew what was going on a little bit you know like I kind of had had a little bit of experience with it and I even though I had some anxiety like I found myself sort of enjoying the music and I was like moved by the poets and I even had some nice conversa conversations during the intermission it, like it just wasn't that bad right and then I found myself actually looking forward to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one and like I actually ended up uh, discovering inspiration and friendship, like not just in the in the artists, but in the audience as well, um, and with the tech guys. Uh, and so, um, you know, um, what ended up, you know, like there was there was something obviously like really special happening at those events, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what was happening. I didn't understand it um, until Autumn Payne, who's one of our Sangha members created a series of videos where she interviewed artists who participated in the event. And she was asking them, you know, like, what's the relationship? What's the importance of art to mental health? And I think it might be good to take a, if we, can we queue up the videos now and put them on, we've got a few minutes to watch these. I believe is important for mental health because it allows people a way to express themselves. And I find, you know, I've noticed a lot of people hold things in and when they don't have an outlet or some way of letting out those emotions and feelings, that can seriously hurt and damage people and affect their mental health. And I'm speaking from personal experience, you know, art saved my life a few years ago. And, and it's very important for others to see that too. Because if anyone is apprehensive on wanting to express themselves through art, either it's, oh, I'm not good enough, or my work isn't good enough, or I don't know. When they see others doing that, it's kind of a beacon of hope. Like, you know, yeah, you can do that, and it's okay, because it's gonna help you. And I think people should really focus on that a little more, on how it's gonna help them in their mental health. And we all deserve have peace of mind in ourselves and art just makes the world a better place in every sense of the word art is important i think um i mean almost like the theme of the event right expressions so i think for people to both internally um and then to internally create something and then be able to express it outwardly to the world i think art is just a great medium for that and i think it can tap into a lot of sensitivities um because it is so, I guess, abstract and put a lot of color into it or whatever it is. Um, but then also the other way around, right? Certain people connect with certain pieces of art more because it means something to them when they see it. 
And I think overall it just creates connection. So um, I think art is important for connection. <laughs> There's nothing that better purges negative emotion than being able to express yourself in whatever form that is. Whether it's poetry, whether it's singing, whether it's art, it is the best way that I know to offload kind of destructive toxins for your brain is the best way I can describe it. Um. Art is important because it really, um, you know, it's about, it's a pathway and a release of your soul. That's what I believe. And when you do art, you are really just letting your inner being out free. And I think that brings a lot of happiness to everybody. Um, I think art is really important because it gives us um, a way to express things inside ourselves that can't necessarily be expressed by words. So like for me, when I do my art, um, I have a lot of stuff inside of me that I can't articulate. And so um, art enables me to do that because I think art is, is really connected to our emotions, um, especially music. Music is intimately uh, tied with our emotions. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's why art is so important is it gives us an outlet. It gives us a way to express things that are ineffable, you know, things that we can't, uh, uh, um, can't express through words. So art is my one and only outlet for what we experience in life. It's for the joys and the hard parts of life. Um, my aunt taught me how to paint, so that was something that we shared. Um, and that's something that I share with my siblings, some of my closest friends. So it's huge for my life. Sometimes, um, before I've created a painting, I haven't even conceptualized something that I'm going through in life or um, concepts that I kind of explore through my poetry or through painting. Um, it's definitely like a, it's a mental process and a spiritual process, an emotional process. Um, so by painting and writing, I um, get to know myself better, I think. Thank you, Eli. So there's a common theme in all of those videos, and you probably detected it. It's awesome. One of the biggest fitness myths is when people say yeah, carbs make you fat. True. Carbs don't make you fat. I'm a so big donut guy. All these foods that you don't think that you ever get to eat when following a diet, I'm eating them, and I'm in the best shape of my life. The science of weight loss was cracked. And so, like, these artists, they're all creatively burying their most vulnerable, like, thoughts and experiences in order to offer joy, peace, and comfort to other people. So they're, they're bridge people, right? Yeah. And you heard them describe the bridging process in those videos. And the bridging process is described by them as a healing process, a spiritual process that creates connection. And that seems pretty similar to uh, the Buddhist path, right? So the native Tibetan term for Buddhism is Nang Chos, which can be translated as the Dharma of the insiders. And that emphasizes the profound you know, inner journey that's taken by the practitioners. And it underscores the genuine transformation that comes from uh, deeply internalizing the teachings, reflecting on them, and experiencing their truths. And so like this path that we're on, this Buddhist path, it's one of experiential understanding and of deep inner transformation. And so in that sense, we're a lot like those expressions, artists that you just saw. We have to wade through the, the muck of our own personal experiences, our inner worlds, to find our demons and to face them and to transform them into precious allies on the path. One of my favorite uh, Lojong mind training slogans is all about this thing. And so the slogan is actually pretty simple. It says, three objects, three poisons, three seeds of virtue. So the three objects refers to the attractive, unattractive and neutral aspects of our experiences. The, um, where did I look? I lost it here. <laughs> uh, so the, those three objects are the objects of our desire, our aversion, and of our ignorance, which are the three poisons. And then the three seeds of virtue refers to the sort of the transfer, the, 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 the um, um, the power of transformation where we can transform our habitual experiences to or habitual reactions rather to life experiences. So the way it works is like we desire pleasant objects right that's where our attachments and our cravings and our addictions come from. 
Uh, and to face this demon means that we have to confront these deep-seated fears of inadequacy, rejection, and emptiness. And um, doing that allows us to transform this um, desire for pleasant objects into the seeds of virtue, of non-attachment, and of generosity. And on the other hand, of course, we typically want to avoid or reject or suppress or push away the, the traumas, the shames, the regrets, and other negative experiences. And facing, facing those requires a lot of courage to revisit uh, painful memories, confront our traumas, and to heal our wounds. And so when we encounter these unattractive objects, instead of reacting with aversion, we can use that recognition as a seed of patience and of compassion and of loving kindness. And neutral objects are the ones that we sort of take for granted. We generally just ignore them. Um, so the way that they manifest is as our apathies, our unconscious biases, or just our sort of general indifference to certain aspects of life. And so facing these means challenging our, our deep-seated beliefs, questioning our worldview, and confronting our passive acceptance of social norms. And so when we encounter neutral objects uh, and we feel sort of indifferent, um, then instead of remaining in ignorance, we can use that recognition as a seed of wisdom, reminding us to be mindful and aware in each moment. So that's how that works. And uh, turning poison into medicinal seeds of virtue is sort of the same thing as turning demons into allies on the path. Um, it's all about recognizing the potential for growth in our challenges and uh, having the courage to face them and using them as fuel for our spiritual journey. So the good news is that once we recognize our demons, we can start introducing them to our community. And so if we want to overcome anxiety, fear, shame, trauma, and other obstacles that sort of get in the way of authenticity and connection, then the collective involvement of the community is absolutely essential. As they say, it takes a village to raise a demon. Uh, but, uh, but being transparent and sharing like what's on the inside. It's time to improve your writing game with Grammarly Go. Grammarly Go is an AI service. And we have to step out of our comfort zone and we have to sort of let go of some control. And that's called being vulnerable. It takes courage. And some of you may have heard of Brene Brown, maybe. Um, she's a researcher, a professor, and an author. She's known for her work on shame and vulnerability. And if you have not watched her TED Talk on the power of vulnerability, that's what it call, it's called, power of vulnerability, and you owe it, your, owe it to yourself to look it up. It's an amazing talk. So Brene Brown says that the root of the word courage is core, uh, the Latin word for heart. And in its, one of its uh, earliest forms, she says, the word meant to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. And in her TED talk, uh, Brene Brown describes uh, research that she did into what she called uh, wholehearted people. And so those are like the people who have a strong sense of love, a strong sense of connection and belonging. And she said uh, what they all had in common with each other was this sense of courage, that sense of courage that we just discussed. And they all had basically the, the courage to be imperfect. And she says in the talk, she says, they had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others. Because it, as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. They had connection, and this was the hard part. As a result of authenticity, they were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were which you have to absolutely do that for connection. And then she goes on to say, we live in a vulnerable world. And one of the ways we deal with this is we numb vulnerability. That's what I was doing with weed and alcohol, right? Numbing vulnerability. And the problem is, and this is her saying this, she says, the problem is that you cannot selectively numb emotion. You can't say, here's the bad stuff. Here's the vulnerability. Here's the grief. Here's the shame. Here's the fear. Here's the disappointment. I don't want to feel these. She, she says, you can't numb those feelings without numbing the other affects, our emotions. You cannot selectively numb. So when we numb those, we numb joy, we numb gratitude, and we numb happiness as well. 
So instead of numbing ourselves, what Brene Brown recommends is that we learn to live with vulnerability and to stop controlling and predicting and to let ourselves be seen deeply seen, vulnerably seen, and to love with our whole hearts, even though there's no guarantee, and to practice gratitude and joy in those moments of terror. So if that resonated with you, make sure you watch her talk. So if you want to see what it's like to be transparent and to lean in with courage to vulnerability, then my recommendation is to attend the recovery meetings here at Lion's Roar. They're the best example of it, as far as I can see. So the format of these meetings is pretty basic. Like we start with a little meditating, and then we recite this text called the 12, uh, 12 Steps of Liberation. And I won't read the whole text, uh, but I do want to point out the fifth step in this uh, liberative process. It says, uh, right view. We made a searching and fearless review of our life. We are willing to acknowledge and proclaim our truth to ourselves another human being, and the community. So after meditating and reciting the 12 steps, the meeting is then opened up for people to share their truth, to practice this fifth step, share their stories, their traumatic experiences, their bad feelings, their disappointments, and all of that. And this sharing process is so incredibly helpful and so healing, and not just for the person who's doing the sharing, but for everybody there who hears it. And I compiled a little it's not a little list, but I compiled a list of reasons why this is the case. And uh, I'll tell you what I think they are. So uh, the first one is emotional catharsis. Um, so what that means is that by expressing and talking about these experiences, um, the person who's doing the sharing, they release up, release like these pent up emotions and they get like a feeling of relief and can kind of help them process the events. So that's the emotional catharsis. And then there's validation and support, meaning that um, what happens is when they share, there's a sense of like empathy. They like the person doing the sharing gets a sense of feeling of empathy, understanding and support. And that can sort of help to alleviate any kind of feelings of isolation and it can like help them feel valued and heard. Uh, the third point is that um, it builds connections. So when people share their personal experiences like this, it can strengthen uh, bonds within the community with other people who shared similar situations. And it fosters this sense of community and shared understanding. It helps people gain perspective. Um, so when we talk about our experiences like this and we share, then um, we get new insights and perspectives into the situation, which is incredibly helpful. I think uh, the fifth point that I have here is um, quite important. It reduces stigma. Um, so by openly discussing traumatic experiences and emotional struggles, it helps to normalize these conversations. And it challenges societal stigmas and makes it easier for others to share their own experiences. And this is where it kind of turns around, right? It helps the community as well by encouraging other people. So, um, you know, by sharing our own story, we can inspire other people and give them confidence to do the exact same thing. Um, it gives them hope if they're going through similar situations and they know they're not alone with their struggles and that healing's possible. It's very important. Um, the seventh point out of eight here that I've got is uh, they learn coping strategies, or we rather learn coping strategies uh, about you know strategies and resources that are used for dealing with challenging situations and get new ideas for navigating difficult situations. And the last point is enhancing self awareness. Uh, so reflecting on and articulating our own experiences with other people leads to a deeper understanding of ourself, our emotions and our reactions uh, to various situations. And those eight, eight points, are, that's not the end of it. That's just like a glimpse into the value of sharing, um, especially within these kinds of recovery meetings. So all of these benefits of sharing, experiencing, uh, sorry, sharing experiences and listening to other people um, in this sort of supportive environment points to the fact that the people who participate in these recovery meetings are exceptional bridge people. So every one of them, beyond a shadow of a doubt, has a lot of experience living the hard way. And they're all learning to and leaning towards the direction of living the open way. And those are terms that Chagyam Trungpa uh, uses in his book that's called uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And what he means uh, by the hard way 
is the path of uh, struggle, resistance, and self-deception. It's about trying to control our experiences and trying to avoid our pain and to present a certain image to the world. Uh, within the context of like sharing our experiences, what the hard way means is like suppressing our true feelings, avoiding unpleasant topics, um, or trying to control how people perceive us. And that approach leads to a lack of authenticity, a disconnection from other people, and ultimately it's a lack of healing and growth. So on the other hand, the open way that Trungpa is talking about refers to the path of acceptance, authenticity, and openness. So it's all about acknowledging and accepting like our experiences and emotions just as they are without trying to like change them or control them whatsoever. And so in terms of like sharing our experiences, the open way means being honest, means being authentic, expressing our true feelings, and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And that approach can lead to uh, deeper connections uh, with other people, leads to greater self-understanding and more meaningful healing and growth. So uh, when he was talking about this subject, Trungpa asks, I'm gonna read something that he says here, it's profound. He says, um, can we remember an occasion when we gave something completely and properly, opened ourselves and gave everything? Have we ever unmasked stripping out of our suit of armor and our shirt and skin and flesh and veins right down to the heart have we really experienced the process of stripping and opening and giving that is the fundamental question we must really surrender give something give something up in a very painful way we must begin to dismantle the basic structure of this ego we have managed to create the process of dismantling undoing opening giving up is the real learning process. Then he goes on to say that even though this process is really about sharing ourselves with ourselves, about exposing ourselves to our ourselves, he says, you need someone to watch you do it because then it will seem more real to you. It is easy to undress in a room with no one else around, but we find it difficult to undress ourselves in a room full of people. So this open way of becoming naked to life and to each other, it can be challenging. It's more uncomfortable than the hard way, that's for sure. But it's how we transform poison into medicine, and that's how we transform demons into allies. And the open way is what leads people to healing, growth, and connection. So at the heart of the Buddhist teaching is the principle of compassion, right? And uh, bridge people, by sort of sharing their difficult emotions and situations and their inner world with others, they're practicing deep compassion, and not just for other people, but for themselves as well. And that mirrors, of course, the Buddha's emphasis on friendship because true companionship is based upon mutual compassion and understanding. And so all of this is to say that uh, in our journey through life, we're all going to experience darkness, despair, doubt, uh, but that, those are the moments when our, our truth, like the true essence of our spirit really shines forth, right? And the path of vulnerability and transparency, it's not about showcasing our weaknesses, not at all. It's about revealing our authentic selves. We want to put our true nature on full display. It's about embracing the entirety of our human experience, the highs, the lows, and then sharing it with other people. So my journey, the stories of many of the people here in the audience, um, it reminds us that we're not alone in our struggles. And so by opening up, by being a bridge person, we're not just healing ourselves, but uh, we're providing a, a beacon of hope for other people. I think this is, I underlined this point here, so it must be important. It says, we create a ripple effect where our openness encourages others to do the same fostering a community of understanding, compassion, and genuine connection. So Buddha had this famous exchange with uh, one of his uh, close friends and students, Ananda. So Ananda approached Buddha and said, Venerable, good friendship is half of the holy life. That is, good companionship, good comradeship. And Buddha replied, Don't say that, Ananda. This is the entire holy life, Ananda. That is, good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. Good friendship is the holy life. 
So it's the bridges we build, it's the, the connections that we build, it's uh, the vulnerabilities that we share, you know, that's what makes this journey meaningful. And so as we continue down this path, we'll remember the power of transparency and the, uh, the strength and vulnerability and the magic of genuine human connection. So at this point, I think I'd like you to sort of invite each one of you to reflect on your own personal journey, your own vulnerabilities, and the bridges that you've built or that you wish to build. And uh, let's keep the conversation going. Um, you can open up the floor to any comments, questions, personal reflections, anything else that you've got. Thank you. Are there any uh, comments here? Thank you, Daniel. For someone who was terrified and has social anxiety, you, you knocked that out of the park. <laughs> um, I was thinking about, uh, this is more of a, maybe a comment than a question, but an invitation too, to what you're describing. Um, as I get into, on into my middle age years, um, and I'm about to be an empty nester, um, I'm just reflecting on um, how hard it is for men in this society to have connection and community. Um, loneliness is, um, you know, a, a huge, like I think the suicide rate is highest for middle-aged men. And so um, us guys don't tend to like to open up very much. We're not conditioned to do that, I think. And so I was just thinking in terms of community, we haven't had, I don't think we have a men's group. But maybe we want to revisit that. That would be really nice. Yeah. No, that's a fantastic idea. I think that men in particular in our culture have spent a lot of time doing things the hard way. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of a men's group. I definitely, I enjoyed that uh, during the uh, my stint in uh, recovery, the 12-step recovery. There were oftentimes men's groups. And it was incredibly valuable being with um, people that could really uh, understand in a different level, right? Like it was closer, it was more, it was more open. Um, but I have to say, you know, I, I mean it when I say that I, I've experienced more of that here in this community than I have anywhere else. It's, it's definitely easier, um, maybe not in front of everybody, you know, maybe not necessarily like at the recovery meetings or whatever, but definitely one-on-one. -on -one, I've noticed that um, my friendships here within the Sangha reveal men who are quite in touch with their you know their inner worlds and are willing to share them that's part of the inspiration that's what i find so valuable you know so i think it's maybe sort of like if my my own experience with it is any indicator we have to at least overcome whatever resistance it is to that initial connection to be willing to be friends with somebody and then to sort of like foster those friendships and to see what they reveal, because in the beginning, of course, there's like a, some type of defense or some kind of a barrier, but then that all kind of comes down and um, it doesn't, it doesn't always in every community, right? So in my experience, you can spend a lifetime with somebody and they're on hard mode the whole time and those barriers are up and they're impenetrable, you'll never get to see the inside they're not even aware of the inside whereas here because you know it's people meditating and people wanting this transformation and following this particular path i think we're more likely to discover people who, are, who can emulate that for us and then um, when they do that then we can it, you know we we can then be inspired and kind of open up that was my experience or has been and continues to be my experience like i don't open up somebody else opens up and then i'm like oh you could do that like, whoa, okay, it's safe, it's okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, once again, thank you very much for your share and your experience, strength, and, and hope, basically, this is ability. Uh, for me, is is that, what really connected with that bridge. Um, I've always considered myself kind of bicultural, bicultural bridge. Um, and I, I, I'm from Ciudad Juarez across from El Paso, Texas. So there's this bridges, there's four bridges. So I've always lined myself, but definitely in the last uh, last year I've suffered from medical 
illnesses in um and i've been isolated so is that isolation that disconnect and i work from home also mm. that that remote as a i've uh, coming from a very social career very connected to staying at home <laughs> and then suffering from this medical illness um has definitely put me in a in a in a spiral of of how that connection is so important in that bridge my bridge right now is kind of cut or it's closed yeah. sometimes along the border they shut down the bridges and i feel that way and and so there is that sense of community and connection and wholeness and truthness that is that is very important and that's something that i'm seeking basically yeah. and very much but uh but definitely the the bridges are important in in the vulnerability to share with a person. Um, I'm in recovery and I've noticed that outside my recovery brothers and sisters, um, I only have one friend. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I have my family, I have uh, my recovery community, but you know, outside it's only one person. So there is need for me to continue and develop more bridges uh, for growth and and for inner sharing so for that i thank you yeah thank you max i really appreciate that i i think that the you know once you if you've experienced ever having bridges that connect and you've had meaningful um community relations and then you have that cut um that's quite traumatic and i think that that it if when if and when it happens leads easily to sort of the social isolation at least in my experience it did you know, I had what I sensed was strong community and, and a, a very connected world. And then that went away. And there was this sort of like, ah, it's not even possible. I gave up hope, you know, like, I'll, I'll just be alone, you know. And then, of course, the mind, you know, says like, yeah, you're right. That's true. You're you could do it. You're a you're a what do you have, like a lone wolf, right? Like you, you it's OK. Like, you know, there's like all kinds of stuff that happens. And when we isolate, we don't have any sort of like balancing viewpoints. So it just like like you said, it spirals and it just keeps going. So at some point, I mean, I, it seems to me like, you know, taking that first step out and being like, all right, like I know I need to connect and being like willing to take some chances. You know, I think that that's like a, a great beginning to building some bridges. And I, I think just like I was saying, I think it's really important for ourselves, but we can have this motivation actually to do it for not just ourselves. Because it turned like we usually like especially if we've isolated, and um, I think probably maybe to some degree especially men, kind of um, it's very self-centered, you know. And I think that to some degree it's helpful to be like, yeah, this isn't just about me. Like me building bridges helps other people, you know. So it's an additional motivation. Thank you, Max. Um, so we've got an online question from Matteo. Matteo, do you want to unmute and maybe give us our tech guys a second to dial in the audio? All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a fan in the background, so I'm not sure if it comes out what I'm saying. Um, I don't know. I was listening and like to your talk and like it really resonated with me. You know, I'm especially with cannabis use. I mean, I'm an avid cannabis user. I use it chronically. I, you know, I'm through some stuff and, and I do use it to uh, just numb my everyday life and to be able to, you know, just continue through. And it's difficult for me because um, where like, you know, I mean, I've been dealing with anxiety and depression all my life, like ever since I was a kid and not until I became an adult and I became a parent that I'm like, I have to deal with this because kids need me here and, you know, they need me a lot. Um, and we're like, SSRIs and Xanax and stuff didn't fix cannabis fix. Um, and it at least allowed me to, to like get out of my funk. And now that I'm out of it, it's like um, I'm still using it as a crutch, you know? So it's difficult to kind of see it as something, as a bad thing because it helped me so much, but then also I still highly rely on it. Um, and, you know, like you, you know, I've been thinking about, and one of the reasons why I wanted to come back to Buddhism, because I've identified as a Buddhist ever since I was a kid. I mean, just for myself, my parents were Christian. 
Um, but um, is I want to try and meditate more and use that to uh, replace cannabis, you know, and use self awareness to figure out why I have social anxiety and you know face things like that, you know. Um, but you know, it's hard for me to talk about. But when the other gentleman was talking about how you know hard it is to be a middle aged man, I mean, we do, you know, uh, we and as someone who has, a, I have a son you know, and uh, where I really started noticing that, you know, our society, our culture really does see men as dispensable, you know, we're dispensable and we do it to ourselves, you know, I mean, it's just part of our culture. And um, I think that that's, that does have a lot to do with it. And maybe a men's group would be a good idea, but, uh, you know, just know that, yeah, I mean, um, it is, it could be really lonely, you know, and it could be rough. And, Man, cannabis helps, you know. I can't uh argue with its with how effective it is to just allow me to just continue because, you know, like I said, I'm a parent and I I ha I can't, you know, I have to just keep going. So anyways, I just thought I would share that. I I thought about um attending the middleware recovery. Just I, I live really far, so it takes almost an hour sometimes to get there. But but I do want to um start attending. Anyways, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Mateo. Uh, I resonated. Everything that you said actually resonated with me. And I, at least from my perspective, I'm not. I'm not knocking cannabis. I, I, I found it quite helpful. Um, for, but I think like so many coping mechanisms, like at some point it's helpful, and then it, it or it appears to be helpful, and then at some point it's less than helpful, and then it becomes downright harmful. And it's hard to see when that transition happens. And, um, but at some point, you know, you start feeling pretty crappy about it. And it, they're, like the goodness is sort of not as powerful as what appears to be sort of the badness. And certainly having kids is a big part of that. I, you know, when they were younger, it was easy. I had I have two kids. And when, it was young, when they were younger, it was easy to just be, you know, stoned all the time. Um, but when they got older, it was harder and harder because they could see me and smell me more. And so, uh, you know, like I couldn't hide as well. Um, you know, and I think that there's, you know, like there's, um, I, I don't know that there's a, a need to, to stop anything, right? Like at least that was, you know, the encouragement that I got within this community here was, Nobody ever told me like, you got to stop this. You're a bad person because you're smoking pot and drinking. Like that wasn't ever the message that I heard. It was really just like, I want to, we want to support you to be the best, whatever you want to be. And to me, you know, what I, like I described with the meditations, what was happening was I was sort of seeing clearly, like clearly for a moment and what I was seeing, I didn't like, you know? And so of course I turned it back off, you know, and then I flipped the light back on and then turn it back off. And it took, I took for me years you know, of doing that. And I think just not giving up, you know, and having some compassion for yourself is really important. So, um, but I appreciate your share, Mateo. And, you know, there are other recovery groups, including Buddhist recovery groups that are not necessarily associated with Lions Road that might be helpful that are local to you. Uh, do you want to take any more questions or do you want to do closing prayers? Maybe continue the conversation yeah. elsewhere? Sure. It's up to you. No, anybody else got anything? All right, sounds good. Okay, let's close it up. All right, dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezi, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. 
merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Arnold Kateshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losantrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Um, thank you so much for the talk today. Um, there's a whiteboard in the kitchen uh, that has some announcements on it. Uh, so please check that. Uh, are there any other announcements? It was. October 7th and 8th, there will be a chaplaincy retreat with Geshe Gendin, so he'll be in town for that, which will be amazing. I think there's also a chaplaincy meeting um, with Susan and Lama on Saturday, September 16th, Sunday, September 16th or 17th, 17th, the 17th. There's something on the 16th. I forget what that is. Okay. There's something on the 16th. So <laughs> we'll figure that out and let you know. I just like to announce that Dr. Daniel is going to be the guest speaker at the beginning meditation this Wednesday. So, Daniel, beginning meditation this Wednesday. 6 p.m. All right. <laughs> Any other announcements? No? All right. Well, uh, please join us for community potluck, continue the conversation, um, and perhaps more bridge people will emerge. All right. Thank you. Oh,